Welcome to Senate Committee on Education. We'll go ahead and begin. Um, welcome to those present here in Carson City, online and by the phone, and by phone. Uh, will the secretary please call the roll? Vice Chair Dundar Loop. Here. Senator Hardy. Here. Senator Hammond. Here. Senator Lang. Here. Senator Buck. Here. Senator Dignate. Chair Dennis. Here, thank you. Everyone is here. We do have a quorum. Um, just a quick reminders for persons, uh, everyone in person and online, keep yourself muted when not speaking and silence your electronic devices. Um, those that are here, uh, make sure you keep your face coverings on and maintain social distancing. Um, our information is available on Nellis online as you can well watch the, the uh, committee through Nellis or the legislature's YouTube channel. Um, if you're wishing to provide public testimony or public comment, you must register to participate through Nellis and select your preferred method. If you do register um, you're, you're to make comments by phone, you will receive an email confirmation with call-in information. Uh, you may also submit comments as outlined on the agenda um, and detailed instructions for participating uh, on the help page linked at the banner of every top of every page. Um, when testifying, state and spell your name. Um, and affiliation, if any. I will take public comment at the end of the meeting and may limit the length of testimony and public comment to two minutes per person. You may also submit your full comments in writing and, and briefly summarize them in spoken testimony. Um, we are going to, um, I'm gonna change the order just a little bit. Um, we're gonna do our work session first because I've got everybody here before I, okay, before I lose anybody. And uh, just wanna make sure I didn't lose them. Um, so we'll do that first, and then we're gonna to go to AB 195, AB 19, and then we'll do 235, 266. So we'll go in that order. Um, so, um, there is a work session document. It's, I know it's available online on Nellis. Here I have, uh, okay. All right, so with that, um, we'll have our uh, Ms. Sturm, if you'll walk us through this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jen Sturm, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, our bill up on work session today is Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 9, which was presented by Assemblywoman Peters on April 21st, 2021. Senate Concurrent Resolution 9 encourages and expresses support for the Nevada system of higher education to work collaborative, collaboratively among its institutions on science and research efforts addressing the specific needs of the Lake Tahoe Basin in alignment with Nevada's state climate strategy. The resolution also recommends that the NSHE enhance coordination efforts with various state and federal agencies to align its science and research efforts with the policy goals, including the state climate strategy that are established by the Tahoe Bi-State Executive Committee, the Tahoe Science Advisory Council, and other relevant agencies and stakeholders in the basin. Mr. Chair. Questions? It's a pretty um, simple bill. The concept, I think we got it. I don't, I don't think we even had a lot of questions when we heard it, so. We have any qu no questions? I will take a motion. Yes. So moved. We have a motion from Senator Hardy. Second. And I think I had uh, Senator Lang beat you to it for a second. Any further discussion on the motion? <laughs> and it's just a it's just a way it's a due pass, right? There's no amendment. So yes. So the motion is due pass. We have a motion and a second. No further discussion. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. Okay, motion carries. All right, so now we will go and I will open the hearing on, Senate, on Assembly Bill 195. And we have, we have Assemblywoman Torres here with us. Welcome to the Committee on Education here in Senate. Good to have you here. Thank you, Chair Dennis uh, and committee for your time this afternoon. I know that I usually speak extremely slowly, so I'll try to make sure that I quicken it up for everybody. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Selena Torres, and I proudly represent Assembly District 3. And this afternoon, I will be presenting on AB 195, which creates the English Language Learner Bill of Rights. Before I begin, I will 
provide a brief roadmap of today's presentation. Um, first, I'm going to start by providing some background information on this legislation, defining some key terms. Uh, and second, I will walk through the committee through this bill. Throughout today's presentation, I will be referring to the legislation and the uh, as it's modified by the conceptual amendment that has already been posted on Nellis, and hopefully the committee has had time to review, although it's pretty brief, so if you haven't, um, I will walk you through that today as well. Throughout this presentation, I will be using several different acronyms that apply to this legislation, and I'm going to do my best to exp explain each of those terms as we work through the legislation. As an educator, sometimes I get lost in that lingo, um, so I'll try to make sure that I, I break it down as much as possible. I'll be referring to EL or ELL students, um, and that's an acronym that refers to English language learners. ELL students are students that are learning English. Um, ELL students in Nevada speak many languages, Spanish, Tagalog, Chinese, French, etc. ELL students can thrive when they are given the appropriate supports, and this legislation is intended to help instructional leaders and policy makers alike make informed policy decisions while simultaneously implementing the mechanisms to inform ELL students and their parents and guardians about their rights. Based on the concerns raised um, th throughout, this, uh, throughout this session about this piece of legislation, I just want to be abundantly clear that this legislation does not give ELL students additional rights. Rather, this legislation enumerates the rights that ELL students and their families presently have. ELL students make up 14.1% of the student population and consistently lag behind in proficiency tests. Nonetheless, there is little data aggregated about their performance. This data is necessary for instructional leaders and policymakers alike to implement modifications to their curriculum. Next, I will walk through the sections of the bill. Chair Dennis, I did submit, once again, I submitted an amendment to this bill and we'll be referring to that amendment um, throughout this hearing. So first in section two, subsection one and two, it requires that the board of trustees determine the number of students that are immigrants, refugees, long-term English learners and English learners. Additionally, this bill requires that the district aggregate the data for EL students who are in career tech programs, magnet schools, AP courses, IB courses, dual credit and extracurricular programs to the extent that it's possible. We know with some of our extracurricular programs that data might not be tracked right now. And so we don't wanna put an additional requirement that data is tracked that doesn't exist. Um, the amendment to this section also clarifies that the data for ELL students will be captured by this bill. Uh, section two, subsection three requires that the board of trustees of each school district determine the number of teachers employed that have an endorsement in bilingual education and teaching English as a second language, and that this information is to be able to be disaggregated by grade level. This will help uh, not just school leaders and uh, instructional leaders make the decisions um, regarding uh, the educators that they have in their school, but furthermore, this will help policymakers see where we have large gaps in service to our English language learners. Additionally, section two, subsection three requires for local education agencies to report on the number of teachers per school that are trained in the LEA's adopted language development program. Many of our districts have stepped up to the calling to ensure um, that we have language development programs uh, provided to our schools. I know that Clark County has kind of been a role model in this way, ensuring that all educators have some type of language development training and professional development. And this will help us capture how many teachers have completed that training as we know that all students are language learners. Section two, subsection four requires for this data to be submitted to the Department of Education. Section two, subsection five requires that this information is disseminated to the legislature. Um, and, and subsection six defines the term English learners, LTELs, as a learner who has been in the United States for three consecutive years. Section three enumerates the rights of an English learner and the rights of a parent or guardian of an ELL student. While these rights are presently available to students, uh, the education community knows that oftentimes students and their families do not know or understand their educational rights. These rights include the rights to a free and public education, regardless of their immigration status or native language, equal access to programming, and the right to be evaluated annually. Additionally, parents and guardians have the right to register their student without disclosing their immigration status, have an interpreter for significant interactions to the extent practicable, and information about the progress of the pupil. 
Section 3, subsection 3, as amended, requires that schools provide ELL students with a copy of these rights uh, upon annual registration. The Department of Education shall provide translation for the rights described in as many languages as possible, but at least the top five spoken languages in the state of Nevada. The committee will note that the amendment clarifies that schools are not required to meet annually with annually with parents for the sole purpose of discussing student language achievement, but clarifies that schools shall meet with parents at the request of parents, which is already a right that our parents and families have, um, but it ensures that our families know that they can sit down and ask to meet with an educator to discuss their students' language development uh, in their classroom. The rights enumerated in AB 195 will empower students and families to be involved in their school community and empower families in our community. When parents and guardians play an active role in our child's education, Students achieve. Section four of the legislation requires that the Board of Trustees report annually on the use of Title III funds to allow for policymakers to understand how the money designated for Nevada English language learners is being spent. The report will also be posted on the internet to ensure Nevadans can understand the use of those funds. Section five authorizes the Department of Ed to adopt necessary regulations. Uh, and section six requires that schools identify the primary language of a pupil annually upon registration to ensure that students are properly identified as ELL students. Presently, students are identified as ELL students when they complete the home language survey. So that would be upon their initial registration. Many families do not initially admit to speaking a different language for fear of making their child have a less equitable education. There's just a, a, oftentimes misunderstandings about um, the English language learner program and they're concerned that maybe their child would be placed into a special education program instead of receiving services that they, they very much um, have a right to um, in language development. Some families fear that this information can also be flagged to immigration authorities or worry their child's gonna be put in some type of remedial program. As families grow more comfortable with their child's school, they're more likely to reveal this information. Section six, subsection two, sub, sub G, provides that a people who is an ELL student remain placed in the ELL program until they reach language proficiency as determined by their state's assessment. Uh, thank you, Chair Dennis and committee members for considering AB 195. I urge your support of this bill and I now stand open for questions. Additionally, I believe that Mr. Ignacio Ruiz, um, the CCSD ELL superintendent is available to assist with any specific questions um, that would pertain to ELL programs um, in our districts. I think you did that all in one breath. <laughs> I'll, I'll take another breath now. <laughs> okay. All right, question, yes, Senator Dondero Loop. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, a couple things. Um, in section two, subsection six, where you're talking about long-term English learners who have lived in the United States for at least six consecutive years. So my, my question is a question and also a comment is that, so what if um, I'm here a couple years and my family goes back to my homeland for, I don't know, take care of grandma, uh, we've lost our jobs, whatever, and I come back. That consecutive isn't consecutive, but I still need that assistance. What happens there? Thank you for the question, Senator Torres, for the record, through the chair to Senator Dondero Loop. Uh, so I, I think I understand the question, I'm not, I'm not sure, so I'm gonna try to answer it, and then if we, if we have additional questions, um, just let me know. But essentially right now, our LTEL students, our long-term English learners can be a student maybe that was registered in kindergarten and maybe leaves the country for five years and then comes back. And technically that student is tracked as a long-term English learner. And so this, this is trying to clarify that though, um, so that those students are not long-term English learners, they're really new. They're, they're really newcomers, right? And we need to make sure that we provide them with the support. And schools are kind of evaluated too by how many LTELs they have, um, that's the, the acronym for it, and then how many newcomers that they have that are still in their programs, right? Because the goal of uh, the ELL programs is that for us to be able to exit kids so that they are proficient in the English language. So essentially this says that, you know, if a student in that circumstance were to leave for an extended period of time, register in school somewhere else, then that student's not really uh, an LTEL. I don't know if uh, Dr. Ruiz wanted to, or, uh, to provide any additional remarks. Feel free, Superintendent. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Torres, uh, Chair and uh, Committee members, uh, and uh, Assemblywoman um, Dondero Loop. Great question. We, we definitely take that into consideration. Don't forget to identify yourself, really Dr. Ruiz. We really look at how many years the students have been here. Uh, can, can you hear me? Don't forget to identify yourself when you before you speak. You just just put your name on the record, is it? 
Ignat, uh, for the record, Ignacio Reese, Assistant Superintendent, ELL Division, Clark County School District. Uh, as I was saying, we do take that, we do take into consideration the time the, those students were here. Um, but really when, when, when they do return, they, and, and if they are identified at, as English language learners through the WIDA language assessment, then they would be eligible for, uh, for any services and resources, just like any other English language learner. Um, but definitely we take into consideration how many years they were here before uh, they, they uh, potentially left the district. And then obviously the other pieces that are very important is the language level that once they are assessed, the language level that they are at uh, in, in order to be able to differentiate those supports. Thank you. I, I think, Dr. Reeds, thank you. And so good to see you in a different environment. Uh, we've worked closely together over the years. Um, I, before, I, before we go on, um, there's a, um, Asher Kelly and our legal counsel had some additional information that might be helpful okay, to your question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Asher, if you could address that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Asher Kelly and committee counsel. Um, I just wanted for the committee's reference, um, the definition of long-term English learner in subsection six of section two, um, that relates back to the language in subsection one paragraph C of subsection two. It's not a limitation on the pupils um, to which these rights attach. Um, it's for that reporting requirement. That reporting requirement requires pupils to be differentiated based on whether they are um, newcomers to the English language, short-term English learners, or long-term English learners. Um, so all ling English learners are still counted. That's just, uh, th that definition disaggregates English learner learners into three different groups based on whether they're newcomers, um, short-term lear learners, or long-term learners. And the dividing line for falling into the long-term learner category is that um, six, six consecutive years of having been in the United States. Thank you very much. I, I think I was caught up on the consecutive and I wanted to make sure that st if students left and came back that we, and we know that happens maybe more often than not in a transient population um, in Nevada that we have. So I just wanted to make sure. And then the other question um, that I have, and Dr. Reese, you might be the answer to this, I don't know, U.S. or Assemblywoman. Um, I, if my memory serves me, when I got my ELL endorsement, I felt like we all had to do it. I felt like it wasn't even an option that we just all went and did it. Is that an option now? And what is what percentage of teachers do we actually have that have that endorsement? Because I know I was at a school where we all had it. So then, sorry for the record. So I think I can answer the first part of the question. Right now, it's not a requirement for all teachers to have an ELL uh, endorsement. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, would be beneficial, right? Like, as we see, uh, as we continue to um, serve our English language learner community, I think it's essential that we have enough teachers um, that have the resources they need to be successful in the classroom. I can't speak to the percent of teachers with an ELL uh, endorsement. I'm not sure if um, Superintendent Ruiz or NDE have an idea for that number. And I think that that's why we want this data aggregated. Do you have any, um, Dr. Reese, any additional information? Uh, or Ignacio Reese, okay. Ignacio Reese for the record. We don't, we don't have uh, information as far as uh, statewide. We could get that for Clark County, but I'll, I'll uh, defer to, uh, to Carl Wilson on that. This is uh, Dr. Jonathan Moore for the record. The department will certainly look into that contract and provide that for the committee. Okay. Hey, can you say that again? Just do a little louder. I think we're trying to get our volume turned up because it's really soft in here and we can't hear. Um, but just if you could say that one more time. Dr. Jonathan Moore for the record. Uh, the department will research that data point and return it to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you all. Uh, like I said, I mean, I've, I've taught in uh, several ELLs, what we would consider higher ELL language learner schools and, and uh, the training that you get is, is very important. So thank you very much. And Dr. Ruiz, if you can hear me, great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Um, Senator Buck. Thank you so much. And spending lots of time in the ELL uh, sphere 
getting my endorsement myself and being a coach. I sure do appreciate this bill, Assemblywoman Torres. I have a couple questions for you. So how, um, I know with uh, various things, and I know when I was actually an ELL specialist in the district, it was really difficult to determine the difference between immigrant, refugee, you know, newcomer, and getting that those data points out. I know that we took kids, we'd assess them in their language proficiency, and then um, went from there. But how do you intend to do that? Thank you, Solon Torres, for the question. Thank you, through the through the chair to Senator Buck. Um, and I believe that information is available. So I've worked very closely with districts so that we could, uh, and the Nevada Department of Education, so that we could come to a place that made sense and where this policy made sense for Nevada. My understanding from my con those conversations uh, that this data is available and would come at no cost. It's just a matter of getting that data aggregated because I think right now it's based like on a school level, um, but this would be data now that we can look at on a county-wide level um, and as a statewide so that we have that information available. But feel free to chime in, um, Superintendent Ruiz or Nevada Department of Ed. Speak not to Ruiz for the record. Yes, that, that, that data is available. It is just really compiling the uh, the information uh, and bringing it all together. And and, uh, and, and we, we already tracked some of this, um, uh, some of this data uh, already, uh, but, but it is available for us to be able to uh, compile. Just a go, quick follow up. Thank ahead. you, Chair Dennis. Um, I'm also wondering, so with the WIDA assessment, and so how, um, how does this bill actually show, you know, progress through the language proficiency process? Thank you for the question. As someone for the for the record through the chair to Senator Buck, uh, I'm not sure that I understand the question. I think that this, uh, my from what I'm understanding, I think the, like how we evaluate language prog progress is better identified per individual people. But I think what's really important for us to understand um, as as policymakers is like the whether or not the systems that we have are equitable and have ELL students reflected in them. But then additionally, whether or not we're exiting students, um, and I think that being able to look at the this data um, will help us make those decisions. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Hammond. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I just had to ask uh, someone when there's, uh, I think it was in uh, section two, uh, you're talking about uh, collecting data even after they uh, leave, I think, uh, high school. Uh, is there a mechanism in place to, that, to do that or is this creating a mechanism? Uh, I'm just kind of curious as to how you're going to collect that data. Thank you, Solomon Torres, for the record. Um, so, in, in that in that part portion of section two, my understanding is that would be that data is available when the students disclose to their counselors how much money and scholarships they've received, and so that's the number we'd be looking at. Obviously, us as policymakers, and I imagine that districts and NDE will put together a report that says, you know, that's known because not all students report all of the scholarship money that they receive. Um, but a lot of times, uh, uh, oftentimes, schools do track that because they want to see and they want to be able to share that. Um, with, with their community, how much money and scholarships their students have received. And so this kind of just says, you know, of the money that you know. So it's for the senior class. It wouldn't be through after that. Okay, so it, it basically stops once they know where they're going and what they're going to be doing after high school, and that's it. You don't, you don't uh, go into the first year job or first year of college or anything like that. So then, sorry for the record, through the chair to Senator Hammond, I, I don't believe so. And I, you know, if legal has a different reading of that, I'm more than happy to make a change. But I, I think that it's just really asking for the amount of scholarship money that's raised um, from uh, from the students at that time while they're still in high school, if known. No, and, and I'm fine. I don't need to know mm -hmm. anything, and I don't. I'm not saying that you okay. need to. I'm just, I just wondering w w what that mechanism was, and it sounds like you got a, a grasp on that. Thanks. Okay. Other questions. Okay, we will go ahead and then ask those that are here in support. Um, we'll go first um, to your testimony in support. Is there anyone in the room who would like to testify in support of AB 195? Perfect. We have two seats, so you can both come up. There we go. Go ahead. Anthony Ruiz, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-R-U-I-Z, representing Nevada State College. Uh, Chair Dennis, Vice Chair Dundara Loop. First of all, so good to be with you here in person. Uh, you know, members of the Senate Education Committee, Nevada State College is in full support of AB 195. 
I will first want to thank Assemblywoman Torres for bringing this important bill forward. Uh, we certainly support this bill, which aims to better meet the needs of English language learners in this state. Uh, we remain committed to expanding the teacher pipeline with qualified bilingual educators and look forward to working with the school board on the bill's tracking data and transparency measures. Uh, this bill is greatly needed in our state to ensure equitable practices, and we urge members to support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. NSCA supports AB 195 to establish rights for English learners and their families to ensure they have access to high-quality education. Uh, educators who are bilingual or English as second language certified advocate for their students and their rights. Research on language learners has proven it can take between three to five years to acquire English. NSCA appreciates classification of language learners in this bill. Uh, ELL or bilingual educators also spend countless hours trying to find ways to ensure that parents and students know their rights in the education system. Too many times parents are afraid to come to the school to engage in the education process that their child is pursuing. AB 195 will ensure English learners and their parents know their rights. Educators also know we are losing fellow educators uh, with the pedagogy and experience to assist students on their journey to learn English. We believe that AB 195 is a strong start to supporting educators teaching the acquisition of English to students. The data collected uh, will help staffing and operation decisions within school districts. Uh, it will also help inform school board trustees uh, with the data-driven decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. For the record, my name is Bruno Landivar, B-R-U-N-O-L-A-N-D-I-V-A-R, and I'm an intern for the Nevada Hispanic Legislative Caucus. NHLC supports AB 195 to ensure that policymakers have the data they need to make decisions about ELL education. Furthermore, it is critical that parents and teachers understand their students' needs. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Dennis and members of the Education Committee. My name is Benjamin Chalner, B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N-C-H-A-L-L-I-N-O-R. On behalf of Faith in Action Nevada, a multi-faith organization that organizes and advocates for social, racial, and economic justice and an inclusive democracy both in Southern and Northern Nevada, we are here in support of 195. I'd like to thank Assemblywoman Torres for bringing this important bill. Um, I would like to start with a personal story. As my family, um, we were in mixed status household until I was in the fourth grade. And even though I had a white father and ed English was spoken, fluent English was spoken at the home, I was put in the ELL programs for the first couple of years of my education. I became good friends with many of those who were in the program and others that were undocumented. Um, and this was before the time of Zoom schools. Um, so if this bill along with Zoom schools were in place at the time, um, I would be where I am and other of my fellow students would possibly be in a better spot because we'd be able to track their success. Um, AB 195 looks to build on the amazing work that Zoom schools have done since 2013, and I urge your support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go, go ahead. Uh, hello, Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Gil Lopez, G-I-L-L-O-P-E-Z with the Charter School Association of Nevada here in support uh, for AB 195. Uh, anything that we can do to help uh, families understand the rights that they have uh, it, it, it's, you know, better for the whole community. So uh, the Charter School Association stands behind uh, Selena Torres and bringing this bill forward. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the room wishing to give testimony and support? Okay, let's go to then um, uh, BPS if we could add the first caller in support. Thank you, Chair. If you'd like to testify in support on AB 195, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you'd like to testify in support on AB 195, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 987, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Senator Dennis and committee members. Marie Nisis, M-A-R-I-E-N-E-I-S-E-S-S, -E -E -S -S, 
president of the Clark County Education Association. CCA is testifying in support of Assembly Bill 195. We thank Assemblywoman Torres for bringing this bill forward. This bill is very timely as we transition from the Nevada plan to the, pup to the pupil center funding plan. Instead of designated Zoom and Victory schools, we will have schools that provide Zoom and Victory services for their EL and at-risk students by utilizing the EL and at-risk weights. However, as we proceed with this PCFP and the designation of the state's COVID-19 pandemic relief funds, we know that we must up our data collection game. Currently, we do not collect the amount of data we need to best guide our strategic investment in EL students to ensure that they have the opportunities connected to outcomes like high school graduation. At first, this data will probably not be as attractive as we want it to be. We know that the pandemic has exasperated many related issues related to the historic underfunding of our education delivery system. However, with good data, we can understand the correlation between licensed educators, EL students, and EL services. Lastly, CCA is in support of an, of an EL Bill of Rights. CCA would be remiss if we ignore that the, this data will only show improvement if we, if we invest in our students and invest in the PCFP. CCEA understands that due, to pass new revenue to fund the pupil center funding plan, we need a bipartisan effort led by the governor. Any decision short of passing new revenue this session communicates that being ranked at the bottom of the nation in academic achievement is acceptable. However, with this bill, we will no longer be able to ignore the relationship between our students' achievement and EL services. As a classroom teacher, I taught only at Title I schools, and I know firsthand the needs of our EL and at-risk students. All children deserve a quality education that ensures their academic success and prepares them for the future. We need you as legislators to make the choice and lead our revenue to ensure that we put our money where our mouths are. Thank you to Assemblywoman Torres for being a leader and providing evidence to back up the much needed investment in case of 12 pertaining to EL students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we go to the next caller? Caller with the last three digits, 800. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. My name is Amy Ku, A-M-Y-K-O-O, and I'm the Deputy Political Director of One API in Nevada. Thank you to Assemblywoman Selena Torres for this important bill enumerating the rights of limited English households in education. There are 300,000 limited English proficient Nevadans who lack resources to help translate documents or critical information. Approximately 17% of Nevada's K-12 students are designated as English learners. Asian American Pacific Islanders are the fastest growing population here in the state, growing 150% in the last 10 years. And more than 12,000 Asian households are limited English proficient. As a young student, I was part of an Asian household with limited English proficiency, and I remember how little support I received from my school. I was reading above my grade level, but I didn't receive any additional help when it came to passing out of the ELL program or my transition into other classes. My parents were unfamiliar with ELL programs and didn't know what rights they had to discuss the quality of my education with my teachers and administrators. AB 195 ensures that students are provided a quality public education regardless of their parents' native language by providing written notices in both English and the primary language of their parents or legal guardians. This allows students from limited English households or mixed fluency households like mine to focus on being, on, being students, not unofficial translators for their families. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 166. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Dennis and committee members. For the record, my name is Mary Janet Ramos, M-A-R-Y-J-A-N-E-T-R-A-M-O-S, and I'm here on behalf of the Culinary Union. The Culinary Union supports AB 185 because it is an important step towards improving outcomes for English language learners and protecting the rights of students and parents. As the largest organization of immigrants, Black, AAPI, Latinx workers, the Culinary Union represents 600,000 working families in Nevada. Culinary Union members come from 178 different countries and speak more than 40 different languages. AB 195 would ensure that our schools are meeting the needs of all students. As the largest organization of parents in Nevada, the Culinary Union believes that having a robust English language learners program is critical to the future of our state and a necessary component of a just edu education system. The Culinary Union urges the Nevada legislature to support and pass AB 195. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 247, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin.
Once again, caller with the last three digits, 247, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Please press star six if you are having a hard time unmuting. Good afternoon, for the record, my name is Erika Castro, E-R-I-K-A-C-A-S-T-R-O, Organizing Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. I want to echo many of the sentiments expressed before me and share how critical it is to move this bill forward. As a product of CCSD and former ELL student, I know firsthand how important this program is for the success of children and youth whose first language was not English. I vividly remember my kindergarten teacher not speaking any Spanish while I spoke no English and how hard that was for me to to integrate into the classroom. It was through the additional support of the ELL program that I was able to get on track, become proficient in English, and eventually be able to test out of the program. Two years ago, CCSD halted the implementation of the ELL master plan, which would have trained all teachers in ELL strategies. AB 195 will ensure that our school systems is not leaving children behind. This is especially important because we know that this has been this has been communities of color who have been disproportionately impacted by low funding of our educational system. We urge you to support AB 195 to make sure that kids like myself have the opportunity to flourish as bilingual learners. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 104. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Maria Teresa Lieberman Barraga, that is M A R I A hyphen T E R E S A L I E B E R M A N N hyphen P A R R A G A, and I'm here representing Battleborn, Pro Battleborn Progress. And also myself, I am someone that came to this country with English as my second language and had family who. Um, you know, unfortunately did not speak fluently the language when we got here. And I am very thankful that I, in, in another state before we came here, that we had a, our, a school district and, and teachers that had what we are trying to implement here in Nevada. And because of that, when I did come here to Nevada, I, I was able to do really well. And unfortunately, you know, I had a lot of classmates and friends that, you know, are would be would have been significantly helped by having the same uh, same sort of rights and and um, equity in their education, and that's what we need because there's still a lot of students, as you have heard throughout the testimony, that will be greatly benefited uh, with this. So, uh, encourage you to please support this bill because it will really help out our students that um, don't speak English as a first language. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 831, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Cecia Alvarado, C-E-C-I-A-A-L-B-A-R-A-D-O. And I'm the Nevada State Director for Mi Familia Vota. I just want to say ditto to all the testimony and support. And I want to add that this bill would not only support our students, but also the parents. This bill does not create new rights. Um, this bill just addresses the rights of our families and children have. Um, so we are in full support of this piece of legislation and we thank Assemblywoman Torres for sponsoring AB 195. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. If you have recently joined the call and would like to testify in support on AB 195, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. We will now hear testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 195. Anybody here in the room? No one is coming forward, so if we go to the first uh, BPS, if we could add the first caller in opposition. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in opposition on AB 195, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue.
caller with the last three digits, 105. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chairman and Committee. My name is Lynn Chapman, L-Y-N-N-C-H-A-P-M-A-N, and I'm the State Vice President of Nevada Families for Freedom. We oppose AB 195. Federal law mandates that all states educate all children. What issues in this bill are already covered in federal law that our state is already following? There is an unfunded mandate in this bill. The Education Commission of the states did a state profile on Nevada in 2014. In FY 2014-15, the state of Nevada allocated $24.95 million for ELL services. How much money is needed for the unfunded mandate this time? How much more money is being spent in Nevada for the ELL services that, was, uh, that, that were spent in 2014? How much money is being spent per ELL students over and above the per pupil spending for our, our American children? Our concern is the families of this state that are already financially hurting. One of my friends who is retired said to me, if property taxes go up anymore, I'm going to lose my house, and she won't be able to live in her own house, and she isn't the only one in this predicament. My usual question I ask every session is, how much is enough? I guess my answer is that there will never be enough. Unfortunately, that still holds true. Please oppose AB 195. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller in opposition. Caller with the last three digits, 490. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Cyrus Hojati, C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. I am totally in favor of people learning English. We have to learn the language that everybody has to know. Many of my families are still working on them. But again, the question is, what the Assemblywoman doesn't tell you is, that, first of all, why we have a very high disproportionate number of the population in our state that don't know English, and what are the benefits of having a population like that into our state? According to the Pew Research Center, and one of the reasons why we have such a high population is that we have a highest rate of unlawful immigrants in our state. That, along with their children, many of them who can be born in the U.S., are contributing to this concern. And certainly my concern is that it is going to incentivize more of this type of behavior. And the current border crisis is certainly not healthy. Therefore, if you look at myself, by contrast, I am bilingual. I was born to a mom who just recently came to the US two years ago before I was born. But despite all that, I did not take any ELL courses. And the, and, the, and the language that I know as well is called Persian, and it's vastly different than many other languages that people already know but are struggling to learn English. I also think it's also a red flag. We have many politicians, when I ask these kinds of questions, they ignore us, they put us under the bus, and they just simply assume that whatever they're doing is okay. Well, I don't accept that. We have the right to know why we have these kinds of populations in our state, we already have federal law that mandates that everybody has to be educated in these public schools, regardless of their situation. And I don't understand why we need additional funding. And more importantly, how is this going to benefit the average Nevada? So therefore, unless if these questions are answered, I am not in support of this bill, and I urge you to vote no. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Once again, if you'd like to testify in opposition on AB195, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go then to anyone wishing to testify who is neutral on the bill. Is there anyone in the room who would like to testify in neutral? Not seeing anyone coming forward. BPS, couldn't we add the next caller in neutral? Of course, Chair. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB195, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue.
Caller with the last three digits, 411, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Thank you, Chair Dennis. For the record, this is Lindsay Anderson, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, on behalf of the Washer County School District. For testifying in neutral today on Assembly Bill 195, I'd like to thank the sponsor of the bill for working with us extensively, as she mentioned during the hearing, uh, to address some of the initial concerns. We're certainly in support of the conceptual amendment um, and her explanation of the bill during the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller in neutral. Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, we will come back. Any closing comments? Thank you, Chair Dennis. It's Emily and Selena Torres for the record. Um, and I, I just want to thank this committee for hearing this piece of legislation. Once again, I want to thank the stakeholders for working we, with me extensively to ensure that we could get a, a piece of legislation that made sense for Nevada um, pass and out of this committee. Uh, and, and, you know, I think um, the opposition called urging for the exact same things that I'm, I'm, I'm meaning to get with this piece of legislation. The opposition called because we want to ensure that we have more individuals in this nation that can operate in the predominant language spoken in this nation, which is English. And by ensuring that we have strong English language language learner programs. We give that opportunity to hardworking Nevada students. I'm excited to, to work um, to do that with AB 195 and I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, can I? Oh yeah, sorry, Senator Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and, and while you're there, uh, Assemblywoman, I, I think I, you know, I want to address a portion of what we heard in opposition because I thought it was important to kind of get out there for, for our folks to know. Uh, as a teacher um, in the state of Nevada, when a student comes to you, uh, and this is sort of a yes or no question, uh, your obligation is to teach that student no matter what, uh, no matter if they come to you speaking whatever language, uh, no matter what background, you don't even ask them where they come from. It's not even something that you're even allowed to ask, really, uh, but uh, we don't even ask. Is that, is that correct? Is that a correct statement? That's a little in terms of the record to the chair, to the senator, yes. Okay, and then most of the testing that we do, uh, standardized testing or other testing, it's done in English, is that also correct? So then Torres, uh, for the record, to the chair, to the senator, yes. And so I, I guess what I'm kind of getting at is I think it would be easier and I think our test scores overall would probably go up if the student actually understood the question that's being asked of them on the test, is that correct? 100% uh, correct through the chair to the senator. Okay, so I guess the, the end uh, result is that what we're trying to achieve is we want to make sure that parents know that these are their rights so that perhaps we get more participation from the parent. That way they know these are your rights, this is the right of the students, we're going to have them come in um, and then make sure that uh, we are on the same path as you are. We're, we're, we're on the same page and we're trying to make this student more academically proficient in the English language in order for their own test scores, their own lives to improve, right? Uh, their potential uh, earning goes up, uh, but also so that uh, the schools um, and uh, their overall schools in the state education system goes up. Correct statement? Thank Fair you. statement? Uh, Asalona Torres, you're the chair to the senator. Yeah, 100%. I think if we're able to increase parent engagement, no matter what the parents' native language or the students' native language, we're able to have um, a better education system as a whole. And I do think that AB 195 does exactly that. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And I, just a last comment, um, because that just reminded me, not only does this make it better for the student because they can learn more, um, but it makes it better for the teacher because the teacher can then, um, you know, have the tools and be able to really help that child. So I'm sorry for the record, if I could just add on to that too. I mean, as an educator, I'm always trying to get in touch with parents and get them engaged in the classroom because I know that when my parents and my families are engaged, um, my students are more likely to achieve. Um, and so I really believe that this piece of legislation helps reinforce some of the other policy that we've done to ensure family engagement in schools. And this piece of legislation does exactly that. Thank you. With that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB 195. And we are going to go to AB 19. AB 19 uh, revises provisions relating to educational subjects and standards. I believe the department is going to present on this. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis, Vice Chair Dondero Loop, and members of the Committee on Education. 
Deputy Superintendent for the Student Achievement Division, Dr. Jonathan Moore for the record, presenting Assembly Bill 19, known as Standard Streamline by the Department of Education. The bill was pre-filed by Governor Sisolak on behalf of the Department of Education, but this bill was truly filed on behalf of our school districts who requested clarification of the social studies requirements for graduation and our teachers who use standards as posted by the department in their intended form, with diagrams and illustrations, and not the limited use NAC that due to its legal nature, cannot post standards as professional educators use them to inform instruction. Section one is a conforming change to homeschool education by adding civics, financial literacy, and multicultural education as components of homeschool education plans, and also removes government as a requirement of homeschool education plans. Section one makes a conforming change in statute so that the changes made to the social studies standards by the Nevada legislature during the 2015 and 2017 sessions respectively to multicultural education and financial literacy are captured in the core social studies requirements for high school. The state through standards determines what students should know and be able to do. The how or method of instruction is always left to the local entity, including the instructional materials. In the case of section one, the family's parents or community in charge of homeschooling the student. Section two makes a similar change by updating the core academic subject of social studies to include civics, financial literacy, and multicultural education and removes government. Section three makes a conforming change to academic standards adopted by the State Board of Education. Sections four and five exempt academic standards from being included in NAC and repeals existing NAC. I'd like to note for the record that academic standards will still receive oversight and accountability from their adoption with the State Board of Education. Thank you, and we're available for any questions you may have regarding AB 19 at this time. Okay, do we have any questions? I don't see any questions. I, I will mention um, that I submitted uh, an amendment which is on Nellis uh, on behalf of our committee. Um, that removes the section on homeschoolers um, based on uh, having listened to the discussion in the assembly and also the discussion that we've had here in our committee uh, to be consistent with what we've done on other bills. Um, that's why I submitted that. So um, that amendment removes section, I believe it just all it does is remove section one. Is that correct, Mr. Killian? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Lock up. Um, that is one now is for this committee, um, number 3341, just remove section one from the bill. Thank you. And then while I have you, um, that still does not remove the, the requirement that the homeschoolers still have to do their plan and, and all of that, correct? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Asher Killing Committee Council. That's correct. All this does is remove the section from the bill that would make a change to that underlying section of NRS, NRS 388D050. It does not repeal that section of, uh, of NRS, so they would still be required to submit the plan. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, we will go to those who wish to give testimony in support. Uh, Senate Bill 19 will ask first to anyone here in the room who wishes to testify in support, if you'd come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association. NSCA supports AB 19 and in particular supports the clarification of multicultural education as a part of the social studies requirement for all Nevada students. Research affirms what educators intuitively know, multicultural education or the study of social, political, economic, and historical perspectives of, of our nation's diverse racial ethnic groups helps foster cross-cultural understanding among students of color and white students. Multicultural education aids students in valuing their own cultural identity while appreciating the differences around them. Students who participate in multicultural education are more academically engaged, develop a stronger sense of self-efficacy and personal empowerment, perform better academically, and graduate at higher rates. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room wishing to give public comment? Okay, let's go to the uh, MPPS. If you'd ask first caller in support. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support on AB 19, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you'd like to testify in support on AB 19, please press star nine.
Caller with the last three digits, 498, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Erica Valdrez, E-R-I-C-A-V-A-L-D-R-I-Z with the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is in support of AB 19. The Chamber has been supportive of previous legislative measures that have included classes like um, financial literacy. We believe these types of curriculum components are important classes to students. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee for your time. We urge your support for this bill. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 500. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 500. We see that you are My name moving. is Rena proceed. Hales. I'm a fourth grade student and part of Carson Montessori's legislative team. I want to speak in favor of AB 19 and specifically the financial literacy portion. My sister Brenna was part of the legislative team for the 2015 legislative session where SB 220 financial literacy was originally presented by Senator George Woodhouse and two legislative interns, one of whom was Evan Gong. Brenna and the Carson Montessori team, specifically Brandon Mendoza, pointed out the need for financial literacy and carefully outlined specifics that must be covered in order to prepare students for the real world. Things like mortgages, credit cards, taxes, insurance, student loans, and the preparation for real life is all part of financial literacy. In today's world, more than ever, especially during this pandemic, students must be prepared with a solid financial background and a foundation. In Carson Montessori, we have always had a financial literacy component in practical life lessons. It took two sessions to get the financial literacy bill through the legislature, and we must keep it. AB 19 simply puts these real life skills in one place. My name is Charvi Basanta, C-H-A-A-R-V-I, C-A-S-A-N-T-H. I am in fourth grade and part of Carson Montessori's student legislative team. I'm here from India going to school in America because my dad was hired by the state of Nevada as part of their technology department. I want to speak in favor of AB 19 and specifically the civics portion of this bill. My sister, Purvi, was part of Carson Montessori's legislative team for the 2017 legislative session that worked on both the financial literacy, SB 220, and the civics bill, SB 322. I want to talk about the importance of civics education and specifically the assessment piece that is required to be used. The naturalization test is by far the most logical, efficient assessment. It is not, it not only assesses, it teaches. If you get an answer wrong, it will immediately go to a tutorial that teaches you the concept. To quote my sister during her testimony, Every person needs to know about his or her country, its laws, and its history, because without that knowledge, you won't be a well-informed citizen. To take in, to take everyone in America has rights, but those who have rights have a price, and to take this test seems like such a simple way to pay that price. I could not agree more with my sister. Please pass the AB 19 so that these essential learning components remain intact. My name is Hank Brown. I'm in, I'm in fourth grade and a member of the Carson Montessori student legislative team. I'm here today to speak in support of AB 19, which has consolidated several pieces of legislation. Countless hours of research, careful consideration to not overload teachers with more mandates and now three legislative sessions have gone into the development of AB 19. 
My sister Sadie was part of both the 2017 and the 2019 legislative session, and I have strict orders that we need to be sure AB 19 gets passed. Sadie was part of a real-world, hands-on legislative process where the students, with the help of Assemblywoman Sarah Peters, wrote AB 182 and lobbied it through the legislature, making NEON the new state element for the state of Nevada. She stated over and over, we learn with a purpose. That is exactly what AB 19 does. It puts these purposeful, practical, necessary real-life skills, including learning about all cultures, traditions, and beliefs in the world together in one place. It simplifies and helps to not overload the teacher's plates. To have all these practical life skills that are essential to our education implemented in an organized one-stop shop in Essential. Like Evan Gong and my sister Sadie, both whom have started stated over and over, we need to ensure the mission of providing the best instruction possible while making it as, effect, as efficient and effective as possible. We support the passage of AB 19 in close Senator Don Darrow Don Luke. We know you are on the record for continually stating the end goal for education is to make productive, successful, law-abiding citizens, and we could not agree more. AB 19 is the perfect way to do that. Thank you. Okay, sounds like they're done. Wonderful testimony. Thank you. Um, let's go to the next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits, 692. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Przynski, M-A-R-Y-P-I-E-R-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I, representing the Nevada Association of School Superintendents. And we are in support of this legislation. This piece of the legislation clarifies what's included in the social studies curriculum, and we appreciate the bill being brought forward. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 411. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes, and you may begin. I'm sorry, Chair, it looks like we actually lost that caller. So as of right now, you have no more callers in support for the bill at this time. Okay, and if we lost them, if they'll call back, come, we'll put them back on. Um, let's go then to um, those wishing to give testimony in opposition. Anybody here in the room? Okay, if not, BPS, uh, please add the next caller in opposition. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in opposition for AB19, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you'd like to testify in opposition for AB 19, please press star nine. Caller with the last three digits, 504, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. My name is Brittany Sheehan, B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y-S-H-E-E-H-A-N. I am testifying in opposition of AB 19 today. My largest concern on the bill is the impact to homeschooling education. We do not want to go into people's homes and start telling them that they need to teach multicultural studies, which by the way, seems a little bit vague and not clearly defined. Um, it's being said that this is a clarification of education standards on social studies, but the definition of social studies is history, geography, and political science. It doesn't say anything about uh, multicultural studies. So I disagree that it's a clarification. It's a new and different standard. And I do support the amendment that was supposed to remove homeschooling, but I am in opposition to the entirety of the bill. 
I'm a little confused on why you would take away government at the homeschool level and then add civics to the other students. I don't, I don't think that that's cohesive. I think that sets um, a different standard in this bill, which I find confusing. So I do hope that you guys will support the amendment to remove homeschoolers because they are widely opposed to changing those standards. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 751. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. <clears throat> Wiz Rosard, W-I-Z, last name R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. Calling as a parent, uh, African-American, Nevada, and I ask that everyone oppose this bill. Uh, as the previous caller kind of stated here, I have some concerns with the title and description of multicultural education. More importantly, this, more, this has to do with the authority that the government is asking uh, to impede on the ability for parents like myself who have chose to homeschool my kids for very good reasons uh, to, to, to basically undermine our ability to have control over our kids' education by forcing a perspective or a category onto us is just uh, is unprecedented. So I ask that you all oppose this, and uh, I too had concerns to see the word government removed. I think government needs to be taught and learned a lot more in depth, um, and to, to see that category removed and replaced with civics is problematic. And, and altogether, like I said, <clears throat> homeschoolers, we do a pretty good job in really diving into uh, actually going more in depth with our children on these issues already. Uh, and so for this to be more of a power authority perspective, I see this being abuse and uh, people not feeling that certain families are not teaching what they think their students should be te or their kids should be learning is very, very problematic and, and it attacks the very core foundation of parenthood. So with that said, I ask everyone to please support the amendment to exempt homeschooling um, and uh, more importantly, to protect parents in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go now to um, those wishing to give testimony in neutral on the bill. To testify in neutral on AB19, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you'd like to testify in neutral on AB19, please press star nine. Caller with the last three digits, 170, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Once again, caller with the last three digits, 170. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Hi, this is Elisa Wall, E-L-I-S-S-A-W-A-H-L. -S -S I'm the chair of the Nevada Homeschool Network. We're testifying in neutral today, which is a surprise to all of us. Um, we've been in opposition to this bill for, for a few months. Um, but I, our board members, our members, and the 1,400 people that wrote into the assembly are very, very, very pleased um, with Senator Dennis's amendment. We want to publicly thank him for this, for hearing us, for working with us, and we ask that you please, um, when it comes time to the workshop, accept that amendment that he's introduced. Thank you again for hearing our concerns. I appreciate all your work. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller in neutral. Caller with the last three digits, 090. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Chair Dennis, my name is Erin Phillips, E-R-I-N-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S. Um, I am the president of Power to Parent. I was actually calling in support earlier and um, my call dropped, but um, parents want the right to choose and direct their child's education as they see fit. And we understand that the intent of this bill is to bring conforming language to the statute and align the existing standards. 
Um, we previously opposed this bill on the language of Section 1 uh, that added the core requirements to homeschool. Homeschool families have uh, taken on the responsibility to direct their child's education outside the, the traditional school setting. Um, these families really value their autonomy, and they're not amenable to any addition um, of any unnecessary burden to their educational plans. Um, we we want to thank Chair Dennis. Thank you so much uh, for introducing this amendment that would allow homeschool families to maintain their autonomy. And with the addition of this amendment, Power to Parent will gladly support AB 19. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 614, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. My name is Katie Madison. I'm speaking as a homeschooler. That's Katie, K-A-T-I-E, M-A-T-T-D-S-O-N. Thank you, Chair Dennis and members of the Education Committee for listening. Um, I just wanted to thank Chair Jones for submitting the amendment to strike section one, removing homeschoolers, and for working with and listening to Nevada Homeschool Network, who should, who is they're the largest homeschooling advocacy group in Nevada, and really they should have been involved with this bill at the beginning when the Department of Education was writing it up. Um, with the striking of section one, I am neutral to AB 19. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go back. Any, do we have any closing comments from the department? Jonathan Moore for the record, not at this time, Chair Dennis. Thank you. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and close the hearing on AB 19 and open the hearing on AB 235, Assemblywoman Miller. It's good to have you here. We're going to have you with, uh, with us for a little while here. Right. <laughs> so whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hello, Chair Dennis and Vice Chair Dondero Loop. I'm Brittany Miller representing Assembly District 5 in Clark County. And I'm here today alongside Lieutenant Governor Kate Marshall to present Assembly Bill 235 for your consideration. A little background information. The Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA for short, is a form used by students to apply for college and other post-secondary technical and vocational training. The FAFSA is free to submit and used by the federal government and post-secondary institutions to determine whether a student qualifies for need-based financial aid. Assembly Bill 235 expands the responsibility of school district and charter high schools in providing information and otherwise assisting students and families in filling out the FAFSA. Before the pandemic, I was at a conference alongside Vice Chair Dondero Loop um, of the Education Commission of the States where I heard Governor Tom Wolf of Pennsylvania talk about legislation they were bringing around FAFSA. I quickly learned that a few other states had implemented mandatory applications of their high school seniors. While I do not support mandatory, mandatory requirements for all students, I do believe that our school districts and NCHI institutions collaborating and combining existing efforts can, can assist many more Nevada students in its completion. There are currently many activities and efforts occurring, so I don't want to make it sound like there's nothing out there happening, but the strength is in unifying our efforts that will make the real impact for more students and families. In 2018, the National Center for Education Statistics published the results of a study undertaken to figure out why more students were not completing FAFSA. The center found that roughly 65% 65 65 of students completed the form. Of those who did not complete the form, 33% thought they or their family could not could afford training or college without it. 32% thought they were ineligible for financial aid. 28% did not want to take on the debt. 
not understanding that there's also free grants available that you don't have to pay back at all. 23% did not have enough information on how to complete the FAFSA. 15% did not even know um, that a FAFSA existed. And 9% thought the FAFSA forms were too much work or too time consuming, which is what we often hear um, about the challenges around completing the application. Again, this process determines and leads to the financial aid that students can receive for their post-secondary education. And in today's world, we know that you need a post-secondary degree or training. Our goal in K through 12 is to get our students to their next step. The website NerdWallet found that Nevada's class of 2018 left behind more than $17 million in unclaimed federal aid. They estimated that 33% of graduates or 8,200 students did not fill out the FAFSA that year and that 4,800 of those students would have been eligible for federal student aid of approximately $3,600 each. Clark County's own Data Insight Partners maintains a FAFSA tracker that shows the percentage of students filling out the FAFSA for each high school in the state. According to their research, FAFSA submissions are down 11% from the same time last year. In order to get our students back on track for college and career training, especially in these unprecedented times, we want to ensure that they're getting all the financial aid for which they qualify. Hence why I requested Assembly Bill 235. I will go briefly through a few major parts of the bill at this point. Section 1 requires that high schools uh, educate 12th grade students and families on the importance of filling out the FAFSA and, of course, that it's not just for college. It also requires that in our two largest school districts that they hold two FAFSA assistance events while our other 15 smaller districts will hold one FAFSA event each year. It also needs to be at the very beginning of October, which is when uh, the federal government recommends that they basically say the early bird gets the worm that um, it's more lucrative to apply for. And three, which is really the essence of this bill, is to coordinate efforts with higher education institutes, including that staff would be present at the high school events to ensure that students and families receive the necessary support if they choose in completing the FAFSA. Basically, we're opening the schools where students and families are already familiar and comfortable with so that they have the opportunity to come in, use the school technology, which is also a barrier if you don't have it at home, and have um, our higher ed experts there on site, readily available to help them with the process. Additionally, districts will report the data to the state's treasurer's office that manages our state scholarship programs. In closing, or I'm sorry, actually I'm not closing, at this time, <laughs> I would like to turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Governor Kate Marshall. Thank well, you, and thank you. Uh, for letting me be a co-presenter um, with you. It's actually an honor. I, I also want to thank the members of the committee. I know you have so much work these days um, to take the time to hear about uh, a simple thing, really, filling out the FAFSA. Um, I appreciate your taking that time. I, I just wanted to add uh, a personal story. Um, I came from a family that had not uh, attended college. Um, uh, I ended up going to a parochial school uh, on a scholarship and uh, worked in the library, or I'm sorry, in the bookstore at the school in the morning and in the afternoon uh, to pay for my tuition there. Um, and so the mother superior at that school um, demanded that I take the SAT, other, otherwise I would get detention, which is the only reason I took the SAT because I didn't want to get detention and then uh, called my parents in for a parent-teacher meeting and told my father under uh, no uncertain terms he would be filling out the FAFSA. Uh, my father thought uh, uh, that the important thing in getting a job was to have a job with benefits. Um, he didn't think that college was for anyone in our family. Uh, those were for other people. Uh, and wasn't inclined to even know what to do with something called the FAFSA. That uh, act uh, changed my life. Uh, I did end up going to college. I remember not even knowing what colleges to put. I just put colleges I had heard of. In other words, <laughs> I didn't 
have any sense of what colleges one might go to. Um, but that opportunity meant that I got Pell Grants, I got uh, Cal Grant A and Cal Grant B, and I got called by colleges saying that I could actually go there. Uh, and, and that changed my life. I, I, I wouldn't be here in front of you today. Um, I would not be a college educated person uh, without uh, the mother superior simply saying it would happen. So I think what's being done today is really, really important. I, I think it's something that is actually a, a cheap way, if you will, to um, get our kids to have some opportunity. There are other states that do this. Louisiana, Illinois, Texas have varying degrees of policies requiring FAFSAs. Um, I thought it was really, really important to say that many people don't realize that they will get financial aid. They don't know that what might be possible uh, with financial aid, they don't see those opportunities in front of them. And putting those opportunities there is a win-win for Nevada. So thank you very much. With that, um, Senator Dennis, uh, we're open for questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, actually, before I take questions, just wanted to, to uh, make a comment because I know we've had this discussion. Um, one of the reasons that I um, brought the uh, Promise Scholarship forward was that um, one of the big benefits was that you have to fill out the FAFSA in order to do that. And I remember like that first year we did it, it was like, I think it's like 12,000 kids signed up. Um, and our, um, our FAFSA, app, we were leaving millions of dollars, as you already mentioned, on the table. And after that first application, um, I think our FAFSA applications went up by 9%. So anything that we can do um, to help, I think, is amazing. Um, one of the things that we, we saw, that even though they, they made, um, many of the kids that actually signed up for the, for the promise realized that they had enough money with just the FAFSA and didn't need it. Um, and so we kind of tricked them into doing the FAFSA, right? Um, and this is, this is kind of a similar thing, right? It's going to help them understand that, you know, that many of them qualify, um, even if it's not the full amount, the for some amount. So I think this is great um, uh, to bring this forward so that we can get more of our kids to, to realize that they can go to college um, um, and that there are, there's help out there for them. Other questions? Yeah, Senator Doñate. Thank you so much, Chair Dennis, and as someone Owen Miller, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Um, so earlier today, we had a really good conversation about the rights of ELL students, and you know, as a first-generation student, I actually attended one of the trainings that my high school did my senior year, and that was the reason why I learned about what the FAFSA application was. And I remember dragging my mom after hours because of it. Um, and I think when we talk about racial justice, this is, access to higher ed is definitely something that can definitely pave the way for that conversation. Um, so I guess my question to you today is, you know, I was reading the bill yesterday and I didn't think I caught it, but does your bill ensure that these training seminars and documentations are done in other languages for perhaps families that don't speak English um, but would like to have access to that information? Uh, thank you so much, Senator, for that question. That's a great question. It actually does not guarantee that the supports will be offered in multiple languages which I know that coming, just thinking of Clark County School District where we speak 79 different languages, um, it should be. However, I'm in my hopes that that's part of what will happen because it's housed at their individual high schools. So because, um, again, sometimes we have students where, where concentrations of languages are at one particular high school or community and again, with the resources coming in that the colleges are able to bring to the table, it's my hopes that at least some languages would be available in, in certain um, support, but no, it does not require that the assistance would be provided in those particular languages. Thank you so much, Chair Dennis. I, I just have one more thing. You know, I think here, the other thing that, I, that came to my thought, um, you know, I think your, your bill does one thing that says like, for those that aren't seniors, but like between grade four to 12, like let's make sure that parents receive the information to like the Nevada College Kickstart Program, which is an excellent, like an excellent example of what we can do before seniors get to that. And I think, um, you know, I would like to see like 
I know it's probably too late in the session, but beyond this bill and after the session, I'd love to have a conversation about, you know, how we can have the conversation on college preparedness or scholarships at the junior level before they even get to college, uh, before they even get to seniors, because by the time they're already seniors, deadlines are already happening. We already missed them. Scholarships already do mm -hmm. mixed with college applications. So I, I know that's the, that's the step beyond that, but I hope we can uh, address that at some point. So thank you so much. Absolutely, Senator. I'm happy to do so. I was one of the fortunate students that when I marched into kindergarten, I already knew I was going to college. Mm -hmm. So I had, um, you know, those, that, that experience and support from home. But just to talk about the kickstart, the reason why is because I have also have the opportunity this session that I'm sitting on ways and means. And so I'm sitting there and learning about how much of the kickstart money isn't utilized. And we know it's often simply because parents just don't know about it, or maybe you're not thinking about what happened when, you're, when your kids started kindergarten. And, and so again, to make sure that uh, parents are aware that this is happening and that their responsibility, I believe, is by fourth grade to make some claim or um, participate, not participate, but acknowledge it. Just again, sometimes knowledge is power and just getting that information out. Great, other questions? Don't see any at this point. Um, so we'll go ahead and take some testimony. Okay. Um, anyone uh, here in the room in support of AB 235, if you'd come forward. My name is Mike Dyer, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Catholic bishops of the state of Nevada in their capacity as the Nevada Catholic Conference, and they support this bill. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Michael Flores with the uh, University of Nevada, Reno. Um, I want to thank the sponsor, Assemblywoman Miller, for working with us on this bill. We worked with her uh, in the interim on this and really believe this is really going to encourage a college-going culture. I uh, was happy to work with Senator Dennis in 2017 on the Promise Scholarship, and we saw that immediate, that immediate impact of that of that scholarship and you know we think that'll have the same impact here and to center did not this point about uh bilingual uh the, these uh workshops happening in bilingual and multiple languages you know we a lot of our recruiters are bilingual and we try to make sure when we're going to schools where we know there might be a high spanish speaking population that we have recruiters there and people providing these workshops to be able to answer questions in Spanish as well. We know it's not enough. We know we need to have more languages available, but just wanted to make sure that you knew that, you know, we were cognizant of that and working on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Anthony Ruiz, RUIZ, Nevada State College. Uh, Nevada State College is in strong support of the, uh, AB 235. Uh, you know, first, I'd like to thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing the college in as a partner on this bill. 86% uh, of the students at Madison State College receive some sort of financial assistance, you know, 86%. And so, you know, we, the FAFSA is really a gateway issue for a lot of students to access this aid. Uh, we think that this bill is going to help more students complete the FAFSA and continue to build that partnership. You know, and we're really committed to first-generation students um, at Nevada State College. It's something that we've been able to help really improve those outcomes. And so we think the FAFSA is really key to helping students access that aid and, um, you know, just really get more students uh, pursuing higher education in Nevada. So urge your support. I really thank you for the time. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to give testimony and support here in the room? Okay, so let's go, uh, BPS, if you could um, add the first caller in support. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support on AB 235, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 411, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the record. This is Lindsay Anderson, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N on behalf of the Washer County School District, testifying in support of Assembly Bill 235. I'd like to thank Assemblywoman Miller for reaching out to us. I think even during the interim uh, to talk about this concept, uh, our high schools are excited to support our students, our guidance counselors at the high school level and our college and career counselors uh, wanna support our students. We need the partnership with higher education 
Uh, and we believe there's more work to do at the federal level to make the FAFSA easier to complete for our families. Um, right now it's technical and there's work happening nationwide to make it easier to complete. Uh, and we promise to continue that work uh, to make sure more of our students are accessing the funds they need for their post-secondary success. But we are in support of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 987. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Marie Nysis, M-A-R-I-E-N-E-I-S-E-S-S, -E -E -S -S, President of the Clark County Education Association. CCA is testifying in support of Assembly Bill 235 and thanks Assemblywoman Miller for bringing this bill forward. CCA believes that a high quality K-12 educational system should also lead to a clear path to post-secondary opportunities and includes ensuring that every student receives any grant, scholarship, or low interest loan opportunities available to them. AB 235 helps to remove barriers to post-secondary and create a data collection mechanism to understand how Nevada can improve upon access and equity in higher education through the FAFSA completion. Nevada has a 49% FAFSA completion rate, and it is important to understand what the statistic means to Nevadans. Of the anticipated 33,000 high school graduates this year, 16,830 will not have filled out the FAFSA. A 2020 report revealed that only 55% of students enrolled in higher education completed the application. Additionally, students of color are less likely to, to complete the FAFSA. Nationally, 34% of Hispanic students and 25% of African American students do not complete the FAFSA. Completion is an access and equity issue for students across Nevada. Barriers exist to FAFSA completion, whether there is a lack of awareness, the complexity of the form, or parental mistrust. One strategy to increase completion is to create a system that supports students in navigating its completion. CCA believes that this bill will provide an important informational opportunity for teachers, students, and parents on how to leverage existing federal funds via FAFSA to pursue and achieve success in higher education. Every student deserves the opportunity to pursue this, their education, and cost should not be a prohibiting factor. It is our duty as the association representing educators to make sure our students leave K-12 with the tools they need to pursue their dreams. Building a more diversified Nevada economy means that we work to remove barriers and align our K-12 system with post-secondary opportunities and ensure that we fund those opportunities. The data collection mechanism quantifies the submission of applications and the populations accessing this benefit and, and those who are not. With this data, Nevada can strategically invest in structures to resolve the access and equity issue for Nevada's high school graduates. Of course, we still need a bipartisan effort to fully implement and fund Senate Bill 543 to achieve this goal. We urge support of this bill and look forward to working together to provide opportunities for students who do not qualify for the FAFSA. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 520, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Hi, my name is Rene Cantu and I am the Executive Director for Jobs for Nevada Graduates. All of you probably know us as JAG. I am here to testify in support of AB 235, sponsored by Assemblywoman Miller, to make sure that students in Nevada have the information and the guidance that they need to complete the free application for federal student aid. I can't emphasize enough the importance of having as many students as possible apply for financial aid here in Nevada. For some families, applying for the FAFSA is automatic, as we've heard. But for many low-income first-generation students of diverse backgrounds, the FAFSA is not known to them. Uh, it was like this in my own Latinx family. My, my dad received his GED from the U.S. Army, and my mom was a dropout in the 11th grade. They had no clue what the FAFSA was. And so that first year when I went to college, I uh, applied late and had to take out a lot of loans. The second year, I was able to get access to the Pell Grant, which really helped to reduce my loan burden. So this bill ensures families like mine and many others here in Nevada have the information they need to know that this opportunity exists and that it is for them and their families. At JAG, our own data demonstrates that uh, completing the FAFSA increases college going rates. JAG requires all students who can complete the FAFSA, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we require all students to complete the FAFSA as seniors. Our philosophy is that when a student has an acceptance letter in hand, even if it's from a community college that's open enrollment and they've done the FAFSA, they're much more likely to go to college. In fact, our own data uh, bears that out. When we uh, moved from, uh, when we moved to having everyone do the FAFSA and, and uh, complete a community college application, our college going rate skyrocketed. So um, we believe strongly that uh, FAFSA completion is uh, uh, strongly correlated um, 
to post-secondary enrollment rates. A high school diploma is not enough for students to successfully enter the workforce with some degree of upward mobility. Post-secondary education in its many forms is a must. Even as our students have achieved an almost 98% graduated JAG, it is essential that they continue their education beyond high school in order to find upward mobility. That is why AB 235 is so important. And it ensures that all students have a better chance to enter and succeed in post-secondary education. So on behalf of uh, JAG, this bill, we're in full support of this bill and know that this would help us help more kids access post-secondary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 576, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee and also Assemblywoman Miller for presenting this bill. Uh, my name is Eric Jang, E-R-I-C-J-E-N-G, speaking on behalf of the Asian Community Development Council. Uh, we are here to, this is uh, exactly what we do on our youth uh, development program. Last weekend, oh, four days ago on May 1st, we held a successful, our seventh annual college readiness boot camp, which uh, included uh, state treasurer's office with um, with our team to talk about both Millennium Scholarship and also FAFSA Breakout. So for us, this has been part of our program in so long and having a bill to make sure that all schools give the resources to our students for them to succeed, that is something we are in fully support of. By providing financial aid resources at school, we are preparing young students for financial literacy and especially for Nevada with the highest student loan uh, debt default rate and also for Asian Pacific mm -hmm. Islander that have the highest uh, highest unmet financial need for the national group. So for us, this is something that uh, we would love to be part of, and we urge you for your support for Assembly Bill 235. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 080, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you begin. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis and members of the Education Committee. My name is Leonardo Benavides, L-E-O-N-A-R-D-O-B-E-N-A-V-I-D-E-S, speaking today on behalf of the Clark County School District, and we are in full support of AB 235, uh, we just want to echo the statements made by our colleagues up in Washoe, as well as all our NG institutions. We are in full support as we understand the importance of the FAFSA and the accessibility it gives for our underserved communities to be able to access higher education. And so we would like to thank Assemblywoman Miller for working forward with, for bringing forward this bill and working forward with us to making sure that we're able to address the needs of our students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 313. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. For the record, my name is Tia Mathis Coleman, T-Y-A-M-A-T-H-I-S Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, Deputy Treasurer of the College Savings Division in the State Treasurer's Office. Our division is committed to helping Nevada families as they plan, save, and pay for post-secondary education. One program administered by our team is the Nevada College Kickstart Program. Since 2013, the State Treasurer's Office has established 529 college savings scholarship accounts for all public school kindergarten children in the state of Nevada. The Nevada College Kickstart Program is a free $50 college savings scholarship account for students. The program uses a portion of the program management fees, not taxpayer dollars, to open an SSGA U-Promise 529 college savings account with an initial deposit of $50 for every public school kindergarten student in Nevada. As of May 2021, more than 275,000 students have been added to the program statewide. We encourage families to call our office or visit navigate.gov to learn how to claim their child's college kickstart account. 
We are so glad to see that the information about the Nevada College Kickstart Program was amended into this bill. It is our belief that the sooner families start thinking about and planning for their child's higher education, whether that be a trade school, community college, or a four-year institution, the more likely it is that our students will attend. Studies show that the percent of jobs requiring a college degree will jump to 70% by 2030. As Nevada works to diversify the local economy, creating high-level jobs with better pay and benefits will require a more educated workforce to fill those positions. To develop a workforce that could compete in the global economy, it is essential that more Nevadans plan for a higher education. The Nevada College Kickstart Program, the FAFSA assistance, and other services offered through our office play an important role in creating this college-going culture. We are planting seeds in the minds of Nevada students and their families that attending and graduating from an institution of higher learning is a global with and within reach. AB 235 is an excellent opportunity for our office to expand our reach and complement the work that our team is doing statewide. Again, thank you to Assemblywoman Miller for her tireless commitment to supporting our families by providing additional opportunities and access to post-secondary education. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 092. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis, Vice Chair Don Loop, members of the Senate Committee on Education for the Record. This is Alex Bybee, A-L-E-X-B-Y-B-E-E, -E -E, testifying on behalf of Communities and Schools of Nevada to offer our organization's support for Assembly Bill 235. Our organization supports AB 235 for the following three reasons. Students who complete the FAFSA enroll in, higher, in college at a significantly higher rate than students who do not complete the FAFSA. Further education on the application process for FAFSA and its benefits, particularly for first-generation students who are often disproportionately students of color and students living in poverty is a critical access and equity issue. And in 2017, $18 million in Pell Grants went unclaimed, which could ease the uneven financial burden that low-income students bear to complete their college education, thereby disrupting cycles of generational poverty. At Communities and Schools of Nevada, our mission is to surround students with a community of support, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. We see the many barriers that students face in completing their high school education and the effect those barriers have on post-secondary planning and attainment. Legislation that encourages greater awareness and access to federal student aid will move Nevada closer to its vision of ensuring we provide e equitable education opportunities, both in the K-12 and higher education systems to our young people, and establish a well-trained and prepared workforce, ensuring our students do indeed achieve in life. We know that if we could scale access to supports and financial aid for post-secondary plans, more students like those we serve would receive the education and training required to improve their lives and their careers. Communities and schools of Nevada and our statewide site coordinator workforce stand ready to partner with school districts and governing boards of charter schools to implement AB 235 and ensure those we serve have greater knowledge about the process for the free application for federal student aid. AB 235 is an important step forward to expanding access to post-secondary attainment. We thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing this bill forward and all the legislators and staff who have supported its drafting and the process thus far. Communities and Schools of Nevada is in support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits, 561. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis and members of the Senate Education Committee. My name is Mariana Kiwen, M-A-R-I-A-N-A-K-I-H-U-E-N. -A -A -E I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the College of Southern Nevada. I'm uh, calling on behalf of our President, Dr. Federico Zaragoza. CSN is in full support of AB 235. As several of my colleagues have already stated, Assemblywoman Miller has been meeting with stakeholders about this bill for at least over a year now, and we want to thank her for her leadership. AB 235 is about access and equity for students. It does create another pathway to higher education, particularly for first-generation, low-income, and immigrant students. 
CSN stands ready to execute the requirements of this bill and to support students with the financial aid education to get them, get them through the doors of higher education. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 398. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Senate Education Committee. My name is Sabra Newby, F-A-B-R-A-N-E-W-B-Y, and I represent the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. We are in strong support of AB 235 today. Um, on a personal note, even after all of the years that have passed since I applied to college, and I, I won't go into how many of those have been, I still recall the feelings of fear and confusion when my single mother and I first tackled the FAFSA. Fast forwarding to now, over 85% of UNLV students come from Nevada. This issue is, as others have said, an equity and access issue to the extent that we can do anything to lower those barriers for access to higher education. It's something that we need to do. Thank you again. UNLV is in strong support. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 149. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Annette, A-N-N-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, Dawson, D-A-W-S-O-N, Owens, O-W-E-N-S, and I serve as the School Readiness Policy Director at the Children's Advocacy Alliance. We are in support of AB 235. We believe in increased financial planning assistance for parents and students. We know that these practices benefit students and families and are the right direction for Nevada to be headed and our schools to be implementing so that all our students have access to the financial aid supporting their next steps to college and careers. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Marshall, for sharing your story and Assemblywoman Miller and the committee for all your efforts. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 692. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon again, uh, Chair Dennis and Vice Chair Don Darrell Loop. For the record, my name is Mary Przinski, M-A-R-Y-P-I-E-R-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I, representing the Nevada Association of School Superintendents. We are in full support of AB 235. This is a very important piece of legislation, and I think our Lieutenant uh, Governor's personal story really pinpointed how important this piece of legislation is. We want to thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing this forward and also for listening to one concern we had with the original bill and uh, making a small amendment to, to that bill. So we're in support and, and uh, thank uh, Assemblywoman Miller for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller support. Caller with the last three digits, 069. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis and members of the Senate Education Committee. My name is Kanani Espinoza, K-A-N-A-N-I-E-S-P-I-N-O-Z-A, with the Row Law Group on behalf of the Nevada System of Higher Education in support of AB 235. We'd like to thank Assemblywoman Miller for engaging NSHE on this issue, and we'd like to give our support of AB 235 our institution stated it best earlier, and we would like to echo their comments. Thank you for your time, and we encourage your support. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Okay, let's go to anyone wishing to speak in opposition here in Carson City. Not seeing anybody coming forward, so if we could, uh, BPS, if you could put the next caller in opposition. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in opposition on AB 235, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Okay, let's go to those wishing to give testimony in neutral here in Carson City. No one's coming forward. Um, 
in uh, BPS, if we could uh, queue up the next person in neutral. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 235, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify in neutral. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll come back. Any closing comments? No, Chair, I'm fine. Thank you so much. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB 235. And we are going to open the hearing on AB 266. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon again, uh, Chair Dennison, Vice Chair Don Darrell Loop, and all the members of the committee. For the record, I'm Brittany Miller representing Assembly District 5 in Clark County, and the measure before you is Assembly Bill 266, which increases transparency around class size and class size ratios. For the last three sessions, I've sponsored le legislation to, sign a, to shine a light on the large class sizes in our state including both sessions documenting that Nevada has the largest class sizes in the country. One thing I've never done is request any type of study on class sizes. We know the problems and we need to move toward the solution. We know the impact that large class sizes has on the social and academic development of our students. We also know the impacts it has on physical and emotional safety for our students. We know the additional strain it adds for the working conditions of educators. So coming back this third session, I'm no longer trying to convince you of the idea. In 2017, I sponsored Assembly Bill 312, which required the State Board of Education to develop recommendations for student-teacher ratios in kindergarten through 12th grade for each classroom and course of instruction. The only exceptions being performing band, performing orchestra, and performing choir. The recommendations were based on evidence-based national standards and best practices that were taken into consider that took into consideration the unique needs of certain students, including students uh, English learners and students with special needs. In July 2018, the State Board of Ec Education recommended a student-teacher ratio of one to 15 for grades kindergarten through third grade and one to 25 for grades four through 12. We are extremely far from reaching this prescription in many of our schools and districts. And we know that a major part of the solution is funding and staffing. However, we also first need accurate data on what staffing should actually look like. To gain an understanding of the number of positions it would take in each district to fill classrooms with the ratio of student to teach with the ratio of students to teachers recommended by the state board, AB 266 requires the district board of trustees to base the number of job vacancies in the school district on the number of teachers that would be required to achieve those recommended ratios to the extent that funds are available. This requirement is in section three of the bill. We often, especially in our state's largest districts, hear vacancy numbers that don't compute. On April 5th, 8 News Now reported that CCSD reported only 479 vacancies. But we also know that that's based on the practice of having extreme class sizes, upward of 50 students per class, and filling classes with full-time subs to cover vacancies. What would the numbers be if we actually staffed by recommended ratio? In 2019, I sponsored Assembly Bill 304, which also included uh, ha obtaining recommendations for student to social workers. One requirement was that the Board of Trustees of each school district maintain on the website of the school district the number of pupils per licensed teacher, not averages, that are in each class in the district not less than 30 days after the beginning of the year. During the interim, we found that this was not occurring. Overall, there's a question about the data, how it's collected and reported, because the only explanation is that school personnel who are licensed but do not teach their own classes are also calculated in class size ratios. In other words, you can access reports online, uh, whether you go to Department of Ed or you go to the school districts and even individual schools and individual grades. And there's also a huge discrepancy between what's published as the student to teacher ratio there and the realities that all teacher students and parents experience. 
So exactly how does a school present an average of 1 to 24 when everyone in that building knows that the average class size is above 40? Sections 1 and 2 of Assembly Bill 266 aim to correct this by ensuring a more accurate licensed student teacher licensed teacher student ratio count by excluding administrators and other licensed personnel who are not conducting class. In other words, only active teachers can be used in the calculation. This would remove licensed personnel such as counselors, coaches, strategists, special ed teachers, those on special assignment, those during prep periods, and so on. To further enhance transparency regarding staffing in our schools, Assembly Bill 266 also contains a provision to require each school district's board of trustee to post on the website the number of positions held by full-time substitutes and those through and those that are employed and working through an alternative route to licensure. This requirement appears in section three of the bill. Finally, in 2019, I also worked to ensure that teachers in oversized classes were not harmed by the working conditions during performance evaluations. In both sessions, I reported the data of increased work stress, workload, and frustration based on large class sizes and the impact it has on teacher retention. The burnout is very real. In fact, 8 News Now also reported on April 5th that just for the month of March, 400 teachers had resigned from CCSD. Last session, we passed Senate Bill 475, which requires an administrator who conducts an evaluation to consider the student-teacher ratios recommended by the state board and the impact of class sizes, the impact that class sizes have when they exceed those recommendations. Again, when, when these tools were developed, I don't think anyone envisioned 40 or 50 students in a classroom. NDE recommended to hold a conversation about it. During the interim, we also discovered that this isn't occurring at all. In the, desperate, in the desperate times, we need to acknowledge the work and efforts of teachers. Respect and acknowledgement go a long way in terms of retention. Section 4 of AB 266 provides some acknowledgement of the impact of excessive class sizes on performance and evaluation. I've accepted two friendly amendments in regards to the evaluation. Both of them would be in the um, reprinted version. However, I will say, well, I'll, I'll make that adjustment in just a moment. So what, what this um, includes in regards to teacher evaluation is that there's two separate sections to the NEPF. There is an instructional and there is a professional. And in the instructional, there are 19 instructional indicators or categories. Of those 19 instructional indicators, there are three specific ones where we identified that are impacted the most by excessive class sizes. That would include standard two, indicator one, and standard three, indicators one and four. So what was recommended by CCEA is to have a value system equated to the evaluation. And I believe that the rationale has, that everyone has a copy of their rationale. The additional weight is the class size equivalent to the percentage that exceeds the applicable recommend, recommended ratios of pupils. In other words, if your class is 20% larger than recommended, you will receive a 20% bonus on that one indicator. In this example, um, it, a small percentage would jump up, for example, a 3.2 could change to a 3.84. The rationale is that a teacher who's already performing at a 3.2 in that one specific category is doing so with an increased class size. The question is, imagine if they actually had a reasonable class size or class sizes within recommendations, what then would their, uh, their scores on those performance evaluations be? The, the second amendment was accepted from NDE, which pertains to the professional standards. The professional standards contains 15 indicators. And this involves things like physical space, environment, and parent outreach. Again, these are all impacted by increased class sizes for each new additional student you have in the class. Again, we know that we have teachers that have rosters individually of, of 240 students. In this amendment, it would add an additional point to each of these two standards. I would like to mention that in many states, and in fact in uh, 2019, I reported this as part of my bill presentation, that 
in many states, not only is, um, and I believe it was like the top 100 largest, not only is class size actually negotiated in collective bargaining, but there are many states and districts that actually pay teachers per each student they have over the contracted numbers. And I've spoken to teachers all over the country, and in some cases, I've asked teachers, so what happens, so not only do you get paid for each additional student because of the, the acknowledgement of what it does to the workload, but I said, so what do you do when, if the principal comes in with a new student and you've already exceeded these, what do you do? And they literally say, we just tell them we can't take any more. And so, again, an acknowledgement dealing with the struggles that we have here, I think that acknowledging that we know that we have the workload and also not just the work that's being put in but also the fact that performing at one level when you have ideal situations is much different than performing when you have very drastic desperate situations now in this reprint i've also noticed that the language is not as precise as it should be so i will be submitting another amendment to make sure that the language is precise. And some of that language is described specifically in the um, rationale that, CCS, that CCEA has submitted. So what will be changed is to uh, state that to specify first that it only applies to these three individual indicators, which are standard two, indicator one, standard three, indicator one and four, and also NDE noticed that something else that was overlooked was that it didn't have a limit or a cap on it. So in other words, saying that the, the teacher evaluation, the highest you can get in any category is a four. So it would cap it so that it would just go to a four. It wouldn't end up being like a five or a six or anything like that. That's also expressed in the rationale that um, CCEA submitted. So I believe that um, the amendment is necessary to clarify and make sure that it is very, that the intent is very specific and of course executed consistently. It's no secret that I live and experience uh, these struggles and firsthand myself and the same, I experience the same challenges that many if not most of our educators in the state do. Not only do I feel the additional stress of increased class sizes, but the demoralizing disappointment knowing that as one person, I can't give each and every student everything that they need. On average, my class sizes have always been over 42. And at, with 42 students in a class, they don't get all the time and attention that they deserve. I know that I don't have the money or the staff or the buildings to magically change our class size ratios overnight. But I am committed to addressing the issue as we strive to move forward each session. As a teacher, this was an extremely difficult year, if not the most difficult year for myself and many. I feel the full weight of being blamed for everything that happens in society, whether it's fact or just plain narrative. This is Teacher Appreciation Week. I believe it's time to show our teachers that we appreciate them, not just by dif discounts to supplement inadequate pay, not just by snacks or postings on social media, but by actually listening to what they've been telling us for years. With that, Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members, I thank you for your thoughtful consideration, and I am open for any questions. Okay. Any questions? Senator Don Loop, and then we'll go to Senator Buck. Thank you very much, and thank you for the bill. Um, I, I know how firsthand how stressful it is to have a, a large class. Um, can you uh, clarify, you said, first of all, you said 400 teachers had resigned. So do we, do we have some information on, we just know that 400 teachers have resigned. We don't have like documents. It, 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 well, I'll say this, uh, Senator. It's a very interesting interview and they did interview teachers and stuff like that and teachers that were quitting. quitting. So I would say to Google it or find it, it it's a very insightful, um, interview, but in, and I, maybe I should have prepared this more, in 2019, I have, um, and also 2017, NSEA had done 
surveys and uh, studies. And so it is well documented that class size is one of the primary reasons. I, I have no doubt. Um, so is the, the also, I see this, I'm assuming this is a, a friendly amendment. What that, that you physically have in front of you, and, and, uh, state my name. Yes, only because the t between the two of you, I want to make sure that they can tell who's saying what. <laughs> yes, uh, those two from SD8, those teachers uh, from know. SD8. Yeah, that, that, that combo is trouble sometimes. <laughs> yes, thank you for that, Chair. This is Assemblywoman Brittany Miller. What you physically have, and at last check, it hadn't been uploaded to Nellis yet. That is the rationale to CCEA's amendment that I accepted on the assembly side. So just spelling out more the rationale and the specific indicators. The, uh, the original amendments are all loaded on, or conceptual amendments are all loaded on Nellis, but this was just the rationale to further explain. Okay, thank you, and, and I, I feel like the teacher when I'm asking you this, but so this blue language here, the amended language to AB 266, is that in, is that already in? I'm trying to, I'm uh, trying to cross check this. Thank you, this is uh, Brittany Miller for the record. What the bill came out with, with the amendment, um, if you look at section number 4F, it says, requires a person who evaluates a teacher responsible, um, Mm, under the statewide performance, it says award the teacher an additional weight for criteria relating to learning and engagement by pupils that are equivalent to the percentage by the ratio of pupils for which the teacher is responsible that exceeds the ratio of pupils per licensed teacher. Um, I think a few things are missing. One, that it specifically needs to say those particular three indicators. The other thing that it needs to specifically say is not to exceed four. And the other part that it uh, specifically needs to say is that, again, the additional point in the professional, not to exceed four. Okay, thank you. I, I, and we can talk about that offline. I know we're short for time, or at least I am, because I have a committee to get to. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop. I have, some, I have a couple other questions for you, just clarifying things. So okay. I'm going to stop right now and let the chair go ahead, because, like I said, I know we're short on time, and they appreciate the bill. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Dennis. Uh, I believe we need to do a study on how charter schools are able to stay around, you know, 1 to 25 in K-5 and 6 to 12 with no facility funds. Um, 6 to 12th grade, they have 1 to 30, 32. Um, it's just in our, in our districts, there's not enough classrooms, not enough teachers who who will teach if no substitutes? Uh, thousands of long-term subs in our district schools. And so I'm just wondering how, you know, how this bill actually addresses the root of the problem, which is teacher pipeline and encouraging our substitutes to go back to school and get their degrees, that sort of thing. Thank you. Senator, is there a question? Yeah, how, how, how does this bill address that? encouraging substitutes to go back to college. It doesn't. The That's teacher the pipeline, intent. which is the actual issue. The, the intent of the bill is not the teacher pipeline. The, attent the intent of the bill is to address the existing situation. So there's many other pieces of legislation that are addressing teacher pipeline. This isn't one of them. Okay, um, if I may follow up just really quick in section four, uh, just to be clear, if a teacher has a large class size, um, their only evaluation score will be something that their self-evaluation. So I just wondered what is the purpose in evaluation system if um, random weights are applied? It just seems like it'll be real subjective. Uh, Senator, on the reprinted version. I'll forget your name. Brittany Miller, for the record. <laughs> Senator, on the reprinted version, it's not about giving um, that teachers just apply their own random evaluation score. That was replaced by the adopted amendments from CCEA and the Department of Education. So what I just discussed is what replaces that language. So they get an extra weight based on a variable of more students as opposed to results. 
Well, it's actually very specific. This is Brittany Miller for the record because we said when it exceeds the recommended recommendations from the Department of Ed. So if they have, if your class size, if the recommendation for fourth grade is that you have 25 students and you have 40 students, that's where the value base increase would come in. And I know that not all schools use the NEPF, but so I'm happy to explain it further if anyone has any questions about how it's administered. So the way the evaluation would come out better if you have more students in your class. You could, this is Brittany Miller for the record, you could look at that essentially, but I choose to look at it as when we put that many students in a classroom, when we put that many students, and oftentimes, as I'm sure you would be familiar of, admin also stack classes. So they intentionally will stack all the students that are learning English or all the students with special needs or all the students with behavior problems or all the students that are more academically inclined in one class. That could be for a variety of reasons. I'm not implying that, oh, we are trying to stick it with our worst teachers. Often, those are the students that get sent to the better teachers and they can handle the large class sizes and on and on and on. If someone is performing at a 3.2 and they have 40 students in that classroom, the question is how well would they perform if they had 25 or 30 students? And I know that um, CCEA in their rationale also explains and addresses the multiple studies that have been done about the effectiveness and the reliability and the um, I'll just say that about the NEPF that we've been discussing session after session after session. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think we'll go to uh, testimony. Uh, those of you here in the room wishing to give uh, testimony in support, uh, if you'd come forward. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Dennis and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Brenda Pearson, and I'm here representing the Clark County Education Association. CCEA is in support of Assembly Bill 266. Class size impacts the quality of educator interactions with students, as well as the level of individualized academic supports students receive. We know that currently Nevada does not have the teacher pipeline, nor the school capacity to substantially reduce class sizes. The impact of class size is clear and Assembly Bill 266 ensures that classrooms that exceed the recommended teacher to student ratios are reflected as a weight in the teacher evaluation framework. Within the NEPF, three out of the 19 standard indicators in the instructional practice domains are particularly susceptible to class sizes. The three indicators are as follows. Activates all students' initial understandings of a concept provide opportunities for extended and productive discourse, and structure an environment that enables collaboration and participation. It is clear that these three indicators are impacted by class size. Assembly Bill 266 intends to add a weight to those three indicators equivalent to the percentage by which the recommended ratios of pupils is, uh, is exceeded. The addition of a weight will ensure that class size is uniformly and consistently applied to teachers' valuation. There is a misconception that adding a weight to instructional standard indicators will sacrifice the validity and the reliability of the NEPF, but that's not the case. Two recent research reports recently examined the validity of the NEP, NEPF, one of which was commissioned by NDE's Teachers and Leaders Council in 2020. The most important component of this report was a conclusion that growth on the teacher NEPF was found to have no impact on school achievement. Reliability is defined as a consistency of a measure. Since its inception, the NEPF has changed year after year, making the comparison of, of data invalid. Instead, the application of class size in the NEPF is subject to how the administrator chooses to measure it, leaving room for too much variability. Nevada's class size is a symptom of a larger problem, one of historical underfunding and of education delivery system. CCEA supports optimally funding the people-centered funding plan, and we know that this investment will be the catalyst to change. 
as we wait for the bipartisan effort to target new re revenue for Senate Bill 543, we know that the students and the families in Nevada cannot wait another legislative session. Class size matters to every student in every classroom across our state. CCA is in support of Assembly Bill 266, and we're eager to continue conversations with the sponsors of this bill and surrounding class size I'm sorry, the bill surrounding class size and the quality educator evaluations. We thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing this solution focused idea to this. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chris Daly, NSCA, in support of AB 266, advancing work on one of Nevada's most intractable public education issues that of large class sizes. Common sense tells us, and research confirms it. The number of students in a class makes a real difference for students and teachers alike. The issue of large class sizes remain, remains one of the most frustrating issues for Nevada educators, students, parents, and school communities. Nevada continues to have the largest student to teacher ratios in the country. While rapid growth fueled the problem in previous decades, the lack of sufficient funding for school districts is the main reason Nevada ranks dead last in the country in this metric. Meanwhile, we know smaller class size has real benefits for students. Smaller class size can help close the racial achievement gap, lead to earlier identification of learning disabilities, improve high school graduation rates, improve student behavior, and allow for more engagement in lessons. For educators, smaller class size improves educator morale as it allows for more individualized and differentiated instruction, less time on paperwork, and stronger classroom management as teachers become more aware of individual students' strengths and weaknesses. NSCA supported AB 304 last session, requiring recommendations for teacher-pupil ratios. AB 266 will ensure a count that more accurately reflects the realities of Nevada's classrooms and moves Nevada toward actively addressing overcrowded classrooms by requiring school boards to determine the number of job vacancies based on how many teachers are needed in order to achieve the recommended ratio of pupils per licensed teacher. Finally, NSC has also long been engaged in ensuring teacher evaluations are a fair and valid measure of a teacher's performance. Teachers with overcrowded classrooms have a disadvantage in their evaluations through no fault of their own. The double whammy of overcrowded class sizes combined with punitive evaluation measures is too much for many educators who instead opt to leave the profession. Providing a legislative fix to this issue is not just a matter of fairness, but will also help address the issue of teacher retention. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Alexander Marks with the Nevada State Education Association. Uh, this afternoon, I'd just like to read some testimony from a member and president of the Washoe Education Association, Phil Kaiser, who could not be here this afternoon speaking in support. Uh, we're all aware that Nevada ranks at the top of the nation in class size, but the current structure for determining class size may significantly underrepresent the actual workload of educators. Undoubtedly, this re results in some students not getting what they need, educators in schools not receiving the evaluations that are appropriate, and likely results in more educators leaving education, making our shortages worse. Nevada has sought to limit class sizes for decades. Um, in order to lay the foundation for success, however, the guidelines set by the Nevada Department of Education are non-binding recommendations, and the funding to achieve these goals has never been adequate. So in a nutshell, Nevada has never really implemented class size reduction as intended. Furthermore, it's not just the number of students per educator, but the needs of the students. Recently, I spoke to a second grade teacher who has a class close to the recommended limits, but included in that number are 10 students with IEPs and six who are English learners. Think about trying to implement the appropriate accommodations for those students. Think about the planning and preparation to make sure the students get what they need to learn. The workload on the teacher is much greater than uh, the numbers themselves would indicate. So one weakness of the data on class size is that it underrepresents the actual workload. And if a teacher is responsible for a class exceeding the recommended ratios, the teachers get additional credit for his or her evaluation. The state needs to more accurately report not just the class size pupil teacher ratios, but also more accurately the uh, assess, uh, they assess the workloads that educators face and then adequately fund according to the needs of our students. Let's post the number of full-time subs and include that number in the vacant positions. Let's publish the number of educators that would be needed if the actual class size recommendations were being met. That would help give more accurate measure of the situation and potentially provide policymakers the information needed to help solve this problem. I urge you to support AB 266. It will put Nevada on the path to more accurately determine the workload of students and educators, reflect that in valuations, and help us better address the needs of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Actually, there's no one else. <laughs> okay, let's go to those online. If we could uh, queue up uh, anyone wishing to give testimony and support. 
If you would like to testify in support on AV266, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 987, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Marie Nisus, M-A-R-I-E-N-E-I-S-E-S-S, -E -E -S -S, President of the Clark County Education Association. CCA supports AB 266 and would like to thank Assemblywoman Miller and Anderson for bringing this bill forward. There has long been a nationwide conversation about the impact of class size on student achievement and educator practice, but Nevada has not been able to accurately quantify the current ratios in our classroom. Past practices of including other licensed professionals and non-classroom-based educators into the overall ratio has inaccurately skewed the reported ratios to give false impressions of our classroom environment. For years, Clark County has had the largest class sizes in the nation, with 87% of all Nevada students enrolled in classes larger than recommended. As a former first and third grade teacher, my class sizes were consistently larger than the recommended ratios, and many of my third grade students were two or three grade levels behind. The size of a classroom is challenging because it limits the ability to move around, but more importantly, it impacts instructional learning. Larger class sizes impacted how often I could meet with my students for small group instruction or individual instruction. Ensuring all students' cognitive abilities and skills are met is often challenging, so we must take steps to ensure we provide the best education possible for all students. This starts with our data collection and ensuring that class size is standardized and how it is applied to the NEPF. That information is collected to be able to work towards our goal of recommended class size ratios. Incorporating a weight to be included in three instructional standard indicators for class sizes above the recommended ratio will account for the impact of class size on instruction. Additionally, the addition of a class size weight removes the requirement of an administrator to a subjectively weigh class size on an educator's evaluation. This additional weight will be consistently applied to all evaluations and allow districts and the state to quantify the number of classrooms above the recommended ratios. Additionally, this weight will help school districts and NDE to understand what schools have the largest class sizes. It will help alleviate the stress associated with the NEPF to ensure that our educators are not just complying with the indicators, but ensuring that the student achievement is put first. AB 266 is a proactive, is proactive step in reducing class sizes to the recommended rate ratios. I urge you to vote yes on AB 266. And again, we thank Assemblywoman Miller and Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 149. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis and members of the committee. My name is Annette, A-N-N-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, Dawson, D-A-W-S-O-N, Owens, O-W-E-N-S. And I serve as the School Readiness Policy Director at the Children's Advocacy Alliance. We are in support of AB 266 and our educators. We support transparency and more accurate accountability and reporting regarding student to teacher ratios. We believe in equity and access for all of our students to a high quality education and high quality educators. We especially support transparency surrounding the manner of reporting and the documentation of the number of full-time substitutes in each school building. We know Nevada has the largest class sizes in the country. We must do better with solutions going forward. I'd like to thank you, Assemblywoman Miller, for all of your service and to the Senate Committee on Education for all your efforts. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Okay, let's go to those um, wishing to give testimony in opposition. Anybody in the room? No one, um, let's go to the first caller in, in opposition. If you would like to testify in opposition on AB 266, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 504, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. My name is Brittany Sheehan, B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y-S-H-E-E-H-A-N. I'm testifying in opposition because of the effect of this bill is creating theoretical performance evaluations of teachers. Therefore, it's masking the reality of the impact on the students by excusing it. The children are due equal quality education regardless of the size of the classroom. So I don't think that by creating, you know, an elevation of their ranking or their score, we're doing anything good by the students. And that's my concern with the bill. Thank you. 
Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 411. Please slowly spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, this is Lindsay Anderson, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N on behalf of the Washoe County School District. I'd like to thank Assemblywoman Miller for working with the Washoe County School District on the issue of class size for many sessions now. Uh, we have agreed together that we are on the same team on this issue. Class sizes in Nevada are too high uh, and that issue needs to be addressed. We're certainly willing to report class size data in any way uh, that we can that makes it more transparent. There's no uh, intent on behalf of districts to mislead the public with our class size reporting. And so we're willing to work uh, on that to make that more accessible to the public in a way that makes sense. Uh, what we're opposed to is the automatic increase in uh, teacher evaluation as a result of class size. Certainly class size impacts performance, um, but we do believe our administrators are taking that into account when performing their teacher evaluation. And, and we wanna make sure that that relationship between uh, administrator and teacher remains productive and relevant and that the administrator is able to rate the educator based on uh, the performance of that teacher. And so that is why we are calling in an opposition today. Uh, but again, I thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing light to this issue. Uh, certainly it's an important one for Nevada and we hope to continue to address it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 030. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the Education Committee. My name is Brad Keating, B-R-A-D-K-E-A-T-I-N-G with the Clark County School District, testifying in opposition to Assembly Bill 266. Student achievement and reducing class sizes is a priority for this district. Uh, while we appreciate the class size certainly plays a factor in the ability to teach all of our students, our administration is cognizant of this and takes it into consideration, uh, into consideration excuse me, when evaluating our hardworking employees. Uh, we appreciate Assemblywoman Miller bringing this bill forward. We look forward to working with her uh, during the rest of the legislative session and in the interim um, on a number of these issues as class size is, uh, like Ms. Anderson said, a number one priority for our school districts. And we will also work to ensure that, that all data is shared in a way the public feels is accessible. Uh, all of that information is made public, uh, but if there are better ways to show it, we will uh, work on that uh, and with her to make sure that it is shown in an appropriate way. So uh, thank you all uh, and have a great day. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller in opposition. Chair, there are no more callers uh, wishing to testify in opposition. Let's go to those wishing to give testimony in neutral. If you'd like to testify in neutral on AB 266, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 692, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, my apologies. I had some technical difficulties. I am calling in an opposition, uh, and I realize you're in the neutral position right now. So I don't know if you want me to uh, go ahead. Proceed. Go ahead. I know that sometimes <laughs> okay, that, that can happen. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, my name is Mary Prezinski, M-A-R-Y-P-I-E-R-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I, representing Nevada Association of School Superintendents. And first of all, I think all of us want to thank Assemblywoman uh, Miller for always uh, bringing this issue forward. It's very important. Our class sizes are too big in Nevada, and she is the one person who has really uh, pointed that out over the last couple of sessions. And our concern uh, with this particular bill is uh, in the relationship to the NEPF. And I think uh, my colleagues in now uh, Washoe and Clark have already expressed those concerns. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's good. So let's go to those that are in neutral. 
Chair, there are no more callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Okay, let's uh, come back and uh, any final comments? Yes, Senator, thank you for that. Um, yes, again, still, you know, fighting the good fight when it comes to class size. But as I stated before, none of us right now have the money or the staffing or the buildings to be into our ideal class size ratios. What we do have is an emergency that we need to make sure, the question was brought up about pipeline, but before pipeline, we spend so much money and effort and different strategies in recruiting teachers, and yet if we were to put that same type of energy and passion and financial investment in retaining the trained teachers that we already have. I, it's um, not unexpected, but it's an interesting position to look at, especially during Teacher Appreciation Week, that the groups that were actually in opposition of acknowledging the hard work that teachers do actually came from the districts. While I have already stated and put on the record in previous sessions that there's other districts that actually pay teachers for each student over the recommended ratios and that student-teacher ratios are actually collectively bargained. Two of the largest districts stated that they believe this is already happening. They know that admin are already taking this into consideration. And yet, I would, I would really request that if the districts could submit names of all of these teachers that actually say that their admin are accounting for their excessive class size, that there's discussions about their class sizes, that there's considerations about their class sizes during the evaluation process, I would be highly interested to know who these teachers are, which schools they work at, and who are these admin, because we can believe and we can say we know that this is happening, but the reality is, is that we, if we actually asked our teachers, they would respond completely differently and in the opposite. And it's because it's not happening, even after last session, when recommendations were put out by the Department of Ed that aligned with the bill that was passed, that said that admin are supposed to have a discussion during the evaluation process. And again, it's not happening. So those are my final remarks. And thank you for cons your consideration to the Senate Committee on Education. Thank you very much. It's good to have you here with us this afternoon. With that, uh, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB, 26, AB 266, and we'll go to the next item on the agenda, which is public comment. Anyone wishing to give public comment here in the room, please come forward. Okay, no one's coming forward. Let's, um, let's go to those online. Anyone wishing to give public comment online, if we could queue them up. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to participate in public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Oh, who's gonna do it? I don't know. Hold on. Caller with the last three digits, 504, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. My name is Brittany Sheehan, B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y-S-H-E-E-H-A-N, -E -E and I've come into these hearings in good faith to participate. So, Chairman and members of the committee, today my public comment is about an experience I had with a member of this committee. I recognize that we do not assault the character of members of the chamber, and I will choose my words selectively, and I ask that you give me space to make my comment. On Monday during my testimony, Senator Fabian Donate shook his head repeatedly and later tweeted commentary on my testimony. I am his constituent. I live in District 10 East Central Las Vegas, which isn't an easy area of town. Some parts are frankly dangerous. I feel disrespected by the obstruction of my testimony by my own representative. And I would like to remind you all that in the Senate standing rules, rule number 21 is about decorum. I live in a state where I'm often made to feel that contempt is directed at me. I was doxxed on Twitter by a prominent Democrat who admitted to using the voter rolls to post a street address for me. And now on public record, my own representative didn't give me proper treatment to exercise my right to speak. 
I was the youngest legislator at age 24. I think the way you treat your constituents should be used to demonstrate that young adults can and should be included in these seats with the duty to serve Nevadans. And you have a duty to listen for a full two minutes without gesture or condemning their opinion. I'm asking my representative for a personal apology and acknowledge that even if we don't agree on issues, we can extend respectful treatment to one another. Nevadans do deserve to be treated with dignity. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next caller. Call with the last three digits, 030. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Brad Keating, for the record, representing the Clark County School District, B-R-A-D-K-E-A-T-I-N-G. Uh, I am here with a Good News Minute for the Senate Committee on Education. Uh, I'm excited to share some news with you, all on the heels of it being Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, and while a comment may have just been made insinuating that districts do not care about their teachers, uh, on a week like uh, this week, I want you all to know that we do truly care about every one of the educators in the Clark County School District and those across the state of Nevada. Uh, I did want to let this committee know uh, some great news that just occurred this week was the Magnet Schools of America uh, came together and honored 30 schools in the Clark County School District for their efforts, including uh, providing the most prestigious award in Magnet Schools of America to Thurman White Academy of the Performing Arts. It is the most prestigious award for magnet schools in the nation, uh, and the winning school is awarded $5,000. Along with that uh, distinguished award they were given, uh, their choir director and teacher, Athena Mertis, was named Region 2 Teacher of the Year. So during Teacher Appreciation Week, I would love nothing more than to uh, thank Athena for what she does every single day. And finally, one other bit of good news, uh, great news for us is that Magnet Schools of America named CCSD Administrator Gia Moore as their Magnet Schools of America National District Administrator of the Year. She's our Director of College and Career Readiness and School Choice, and we are extremely proud of everything she's done to increase equity and access in all of our magnet schools across the district. So uh, thank you for your indulgence, and uh, thank you to the 18,000 educators working hard every single day in our 357 schools in the Clark County School District. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and congratulations to Athena and to uh, White Middle School. Uh, let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 411. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes, and you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Lindsay Anderson, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, on behalf of the Washoe County School District with the Good News Minute in honor of Teacher Appreciation Week. I'd like to honor Raymond Swigert, uh, who is, teaches science at Wooster High School. He was named Outstanding STEM Educator of the Year by the Society of Women Engineers. He has taught at Wooster High School for 23 years, and several of his former students submitted testimonials in his support. Congratulations, Ray, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Congratulations to Ray. We always love good good news. Um, let's go to the next caller. Chair, there are no more callers wishing to participate in public comment. Okay, so uh, we will close public comment. Um, let's go to the next item on our, or that, that was the last item on our agenda. We have no further business to come before us. Just to note that uh, we will not be meeting on Friday, so our next meeting will be on Monday. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>